Maura Murray disappeared on the evening of February 9th, 2004, after a car crash on Route 112 near Woodsville, New Hampshire, a village in the town of Haverhill. Her whereabouts remain unknown. Maura was a 21-year-old nursing student competing her junior year at the University of Massachusetts in Amherst at the time. It's been over 21 years. There has yet to be any resolution, but her family and her advocates remain optimistic that one day, hopefully soon, she will be found. People ask me all the time, what can they do to help? I think the most important thing is to keep talking about Mora. But if you do so, please do so ethically and with empathy. If you know something, say something. Contact the family or law enforcement. I'll provide links in the description page. If you would also like to know more about Mora Murray, I suggest the podcast series Media Pressure, hosted by Julie Murray her sister. It is the most comprehensive take on Mora that you will find out there on any platform. You can find it on any podcasting app available. You can also check out my episode, Do Not Forget Mora Murray. Burn it down! <laughs> Hello, everyone. I'm Rick Mullinax, and this is Burn After Reading. Joining me today is an amazing Maura Murray advocate and the administrator for the Facebook group, Maura Murray Strength in Numbers. The group is meant for people with a serious interest in Maura's case. It's not a place to argue with others who dissent with different opinions but to have constructive and respectful conversations in hopes to possibly help and find answers to this painfully aged mystery. The group is Maura Murray centered and supports the Murray family. He's an outstanding goodwill ambassador and I am proud and privileged to call him my friend. Ladies and gentlemen, I introduce to you, Robert Lynch. Robert, thank you for coming on Burn After Reading. How are you? Doing well, Rick. Thanks for having me. How are you? Can't complain, man. Another day in paradise. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, before we get started, um, man, I love that you're a Patriots fan. Oh, yeah. I love the Patriots. And now no one like you live like you live in Massachusetts. I don't. So I was always called a front runner, but I still love the Patriots, even though they are. I mean, may I say it? They suck. They suck, yeah. but I still love them. So I'm not a front runner. So that's all I got to say about that. But anyways, um, how about we get started with the most logical question? When did you hear about Morris' disappearance? Well, I remember back in 04 when it when Mora first went missing. Um, being from, like you said, from Massachusetts, it was uh, it was in the local newspapers, it was on the local TV uh, TV news broadcasts. So I remember hearing about it then. Um, I was in a much different place in my life then, but I do remember hearing about it and didn't pay it much mind or, or think much about it uh, at the time. And then it was only much later that I kind of got reintroduced to Maura and her case and uh, kind of got more involved. And when that started to happen, do you remember about what year that where you started to get more engaged with uh, the Maura Murray uh, disappearance, like looking into it? It was it was right right around the time that the the show on the ID network uh, disappeared. The episode of Maura when that came out. Okay, I see. And I remember for myself, like 2015 was, and it was actually on YouTube 
that was the first time that I watched it. Now, I don't know when it actually came out, but I remember it was 2015. And how did yeah, that? Oh, go on. No, I don't remember the exact year. And, and to be honest, I, I don't know if it would, would have been the, the initial airing of right. that episode. Um, it could have been. But I don't think it was it wasn't many years after it had first come out. And let, it probably wasn't like I, I probably wasn't the first airing, but it wasn't too long after. Right. And that's understandable because it's been aired a lot. As a matter of fact, I think it might be on Max on the streaming app. So, I mean, it's it's been, um, you know, resyndicated uh, multiple times. So how did this lead you into starting your own Facebook group? Well, I had joined a, I had joined another Facebook group, another uh, prominent one out there, uh, Mora's Room, which is run by Tammy Reed who's another great advocate. Agreed. And um, I was kind of her uh, moderator for a bit and then her, her co-admin and um, some different things happened. It's all water under the bridge. Now we had some disagreements and I, I decided, well, I'm going to start my own Facebook group. But the, the main reason I had gotten hooked up with Tammy initially was because uh, we both had the same, same mission about um, trying to combat against some of the negativity about Moore's case online. Right. I see. And uh, when you started your Facebook group, well, we know that it's called Strength in Numbers. Now, when you created this group, did you consider it to be advocacy at the time? And if not, when did you become self-aware you were becoming an advocate for Mora? I, n I never thought of myself at that point as an advocate. That was so far from what I was thinking. I mean, my initial goal, like I said, it, it was to, to keep up the the positive discussions and the positive energy um, to be a support for Maura and her family. Uh, the, the whole thing back then, and you still see some of it now in certain circles, but it was, there was a lot of people arguing with each other, bickering with each other, getting personal with each other about because their theory didn't match someone else's or um, you're wrong. And, and it would get sometimes downright vile. And I, I said, this isn't the way that this should, that this should be done. Uh, if we're spending our time trying to help, it should be in a positive motion, not a negative one. And if you're spending more time just arguing with random people online, you're not doing the work that needs to be done. You're not doing what you should be doing as trying to do some good. So that's just to keep the, the positiveness going. And uh, that's why I'm to this day, I'm, I'm very picky about who I let in the group and the group has rules and everyone knows them. And if you can stand by the rules and abide by those, then, then you're more than welcome to stay. And I'm, I'm not saying that I know what happened because I don't, and everyone's entitled to their own theory and shouldn't be knocked down because, you know, by someone that disagrees. So it was just, just to try to have a positive place for people to discuss. And as I said, it, it was, it was really bad uh, year, you know, a few years back um, in that department, but um, I think it's gotten a lot better, much better leaps and bounds, to be honest, but um, we still need it. So that's why I still do it. And, you know, Robert, you're absolutely right about how it was, especially back then. And I'm embarrassed to say that I may have been part of the problem because I would argue with people with other dissenting opinions that I just thought were ludicrous. And some of them I still feel are ludicrous today, some not so much. So the fact that you would create a group like that, that would just say, hey, let's be tolerable with, with each other and let's, you know, converse, you know, about this like adults and, and be respectful and, and courteous, you know, and also think like, you know, the family might be reading what you're putting out there. Exactly. So, you know, because I remember in 2019, I mean, I remember going at it with John Smith. You know, who I love today, by the way. I love John. But I would, like, him and I would go back and forth. If it wasn't on a Facebook group, it was on Twitter, you know. So, but I just, show, but, you know, that's how my, you know, I've evolved over time. And, you know, so your group, I mean, it, you know, it's a popular group. And this led you to actually be on the Missing Maura Murray podcast, not once, but twice, what was that experience like, knowing that you were going to be heard by a rather sizable audience? 
Well, I had, I had sent a couple of messages to um, Tim, who's one of the hosts, as you know, and uh, right. he, he had said, would you, would you like to come on? And I, I said, I was blown away. I was, uh, who am I to go on there? And, I, and I, I was like, yeah, sure, that'd be, that'd be awesome. So I went over to their studio in Worcester because um, I don't live too far from there. And I, I met the guys and uh, we recorded it. And it, it was a great experience. Uh, you know, they don't really focus on Mora's case anymore. They kind of branched out to other missing persons cases, which is great. Mm -hmm. But um, they, were the, they were the end all be all at that point. They had that podcast and it was all about Mora and her case. And they did over a hundred episodes just about Mora. And for them to even ask me to go on, I, I think I went on, it was, I think it was right before they hit a hundred. It was like 97 or 98 or something like that. And I, I found it to be a worthwhile experience and they're, they're great guys and um, made me feel very comfortable. And it was the first time I'd ever done anything like that, a podcast or anything like that. So it was, uh, it was, nerve-wracking for me but they made it easy and like as you say to to know that a lot of people were going to hear what i'm doing and what i'm talking about kind of blew me away and my the group strength in numbers after that episode was released to the public the numbers of my group it's like tripled um people asking to join within the you know the days and weeks that followed the release of that podcast episode and i was i was just like added a couple hundred more people just right out of the gate. So you could really feel how, how, how far their message was getting, how many people were tuning into what they were doing. And uh, yeah, no, it, it was great. And then they had me on again, I believe it was during uh, when COVID was really bad. As I remember, I, I hadn't been going to work much at the time and, and uh, just kind of did a recap of where I was and things like that. But no, it was, it was a worthwhile experience. Awesome. And yeah, you're right. Like, especially back then, like the Missing Maura Murray podcast, I mean, that was basically at that time, the essential uh, group that was was covering it. And, and I listened, I remember um, listening at my old job, I, I would listen while I was doing work, or I would listen when I would go home. And there are times where it's like, I really I wouldn't say enjoy because I don't like I don't enjoy hearing about missing people or anything like that. But but I was engaged and there were times where I was engaged and then there were times where I was hate listening. <laughs> but it was but you were always engaged with it. So I think it was great that they gave you that opportunity. And, you know, we kind of talked about before, you know, people have their opinions, their perceptions and their theories uh, about what what happened to Mora? I mean, she disappeared that, that much is certain, but how has your views, how have they changed over the years? Um, have your views evolved over time or have they remained consistent? Well, I've always, I've always felt that Mora met with some sort of foul play. Now mm -hmm. who that was because of, or, you know, who the perpetrator is, obviously I don't know that. Um, you know, they, they, they had the, the four big theories, which was that she, she went to um, end her own life. Uh, foul play was one, um, you know, ran away from her family. Um, and then the other one is that she simply just wandered into the woods nearby and, um, and perished. Uh, and those four theories at the time were always swirling around in my head. But since what's changed is, I still believe it was foul play, number one. Mm -hmm. I know she didn't run away from her family and I am certain that she didn't go up there to harm herself. So that's kind of where I'm at now. Um, but the foul play aspect has always been, has always been my gut, you know, my gut feeling right. that something terrible happened to, to Maura, no fault of her own, obviously. And that's, that's, that's the one that I think the most now. No, and I, I agree with you, and I also agree that there's no evidence that she was running away. If we look at things logically and rationally, it just it doesn't add up. It, the, the math ain't math, and if you think that she was running away, and you know, having a platform, people knowing who you are, um, you know, when you put yourself out there, and especially in, you know. 
I guess we can kind of consider Maura Murray part of the true crime community as far as her story goes, if we believe foul play is something that happened. Um, you know, especially in that community, you have trolls and they come out and they harass and they disparage in a very aggressive and cruel way. Did you experience anything like that? And if so, how did you handle it? How did you overcome it? Well, yeah, I mean, it, when I when I first got involved, even, you know, even before I was with Tammy and her group or had my own group, um, just being online in general, you'd have to deal with some people. And a lot of that you can shrug off. You know, everyone can hide behind their computer and say whatever they want. Right. Um, but but once, you know, I, I went on with Tim and Lance and now people see me, people know who I am. My face is out there. Um, it got worse. Uh, some of it was that you can shrug off stuff. Some of it was a, a little deeper. There was a particular time a few years back where uh, there was a Facebook page, and I'm not going to say the name of it to even dignify it, but it was basically a Facebook page with Moore's name in it. And it was to basically disparage some of the people in the community. So they would go after myself, uh, John Smith, some other people. And it was just really off the wall, crazy um, lies about, you know, me being arrested or something like this, you know, something bad I did. Or, and some of it was, some of it made me laugh because it, it was so silly. But at the same time, mentally and emotionally, I was, I was feeling persecuted. I'm sitting here like, who, who, who would do this? Like, why are they targeting me? You know, I'm, I'm the, the strength and numbers unity guy. You know, I, I don't really have any enemies. Well, I was wrong about that. And um, I ended up figuring out who the person was. And unfortunately, it was someone that I had actually trusted and considered a friend. And uh, that, that was that was heartbreaking to me. And I confronted the person and, and said just what I said. Why would you do this to me? Why would you do this? And they, and they could never really give me an answer. So I obviously don't talk to that person anymore. And and to my knowledge, they're completely out of the community, but it, it was just, I had actually stepped aside at that point for a brief period because I mentally and emotionally couldn't handle it anymore. I, I was I was cracking up. It was affecting my time with my family. It was affecting um, my, my job. And it just wasn't, I was spending so much time worrying about that. I wasn't looking into Maura's case or trying to support her family or do any of the things that I wanted to do. So I actually bowed out for a short period, but as soon as I knew that was over, I thought to myself, I, I can't, I can't not do this at this point. I can't not do this. So I came back into the fold and, you know, I, I never shut my group down. I had my co-admin run it. Thank God for her. And she took care of things while I was gone for a few months there, but um, I came back stronger than ever. And uh, now you couldn't drag me away. Well, first off, I'm, I'm glad that you decided to keep going. So I'm happy about that, but man, why? It's absolutely terrible that someone would do something like that. And did anyone like whatever this gr person group was or this page was saying, was anyone thinking that any of what they were saying was true? No, I, like I said, it was, it was so, the stuff was so off the wall and just, I see nobody, you know, ever reached out to me seriously and said, oh, did you get arrested for this? I mean, one of them, they said I was at the the insurrection at the Capitol that had that had gone down. And really? I've never, I've, I've never been to Washington, D.C., so <laughs> I wasn't there. You know? Wow. All right. Well, that I mean, was at least the, yeah, that was one of the funny ones that I laughed because I was like, that's just that's just asinine. But uh, I can't even remember what some of them are because I put it put it behind me the best I can. But it was uh even the stuff about John, I mean, we, we laugh, we, we laughed about it afterwards, you know, cause it was like, this is the craziest stuff I've ever seen. And it was all, it was all done to people that are actually trying to make a difference and trying to do it the right way. So it was, why are you attacking us? And I probably shouldn't say this, but there's a lot of people out there you could attack and not us cause they're not doing it the right way, but I'm not going down that road. Right. No, understandable. <laughs> and 
yeah, as horrific as, as the things that were being said, I'm just glad that no one took it seriously to have that kind of defamation. So at least there's that, but it doesn't take away the, the horrific things that were being posted and said. So, and at the end of the day, I'm glad that you decided to, um, to stick around. Uh, do you recall um, how long you took a hiatus for? I think it was just, it was just for a few months. A few months? Two to three months, something, something like that. And then, cause then it got cleared up. Uh, cause it, when I took the hiatus, if nobody knew what, nobody knew who it was, nobody knew what was happening. And then I had gotten wind of who it was. And I, like I said, I confronted them and, and they admitted to it. So once that was all on the table, I said, well, it's not going to have, I don't think it's going to happen again because now it's not a big secret. So I should go back. And I did think about it. I really thought about it and I'm glad I came back too. And it's, uh, like I said, it made me stronger, made me, made it for the better for me. And, uh, I'm, I'm in it till the end now. Amen, brother. I'm happy to hear that. And so you've, you've been to the, uh, I hate to use the word anniversary. I don't like to use that word, but the vigils you've been to the, uh, the 19th and the 20th vigil. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. I've never been to one. I'm hoping that I will. I mean, one, I, I hope that Mora gets found. And if there is going to be one, I, you know, I, I would like to be there. But what can you tell me about your experience? What was it like? Well, the first one I went to was, was like you said, it was in 2023. And um, it was, a, I had always wanted to go. And I'd always wanted to go to the crash site itself. And I, for, for years, I kept saying, I got to get up there and see it. But um, my career keeps me busy. My family keeps me busy as well. So I, I could just never squeeze in the time to get up there. And it's not even really that far. But uh, 2023, I, I, or the end of 2022, I should say, I decided I'm, I'm going to the vigil in February. And I went up there and it, it was, the, that first time it was, a lot of nerves i had a lot of nerves I, you know but it was also i hate to use the word exciting and i was mainly excited because i was going to get to meet some of the other advocates people that i had spoken to online people i'd spoken to on the phone people whose groups i belong to um, that i was going to get to meet some of these people in person and i i thought that would that would be a great thing and, and also uh to meet the murrays themselves and, and show them my support so the first one was a it was, you know, you got more of a cautious, you know, I don't want to say the wrong thing. I don't want to put my foot in my mouth or act like an idiot or something like that. But um, right. seeing the crash site for the first time that year was was very eye opening because of the, the small size of it. Um, seeing pictures of it and seeing it on on TV really doesn't do it justice. It's the, the space there is very, very compact, more so than you would think by seeing the photos and um, the video. It's it's a very small area with with the like the Westmans and the Marats and where the Atwoods lived, those homes and the proximity of how close everything was was really eye opening to me. It, it was the guy stood there and was just kind of looking at it. I remember when I went up with a fellow member of the group. And when we drove into town, we actually came in the back way. So we, we were driving and having never been up there, I didn't know exactly where we were. We GPS was barely working and um, came out of just thick wooded area. And all of a sudden I see the weathered barn in the distance and I, and there's Butch Atwood's house where it used to be. And I, I said, we're here. So we drove through, turned around. We drove through like four times, went really slow because it was still daylight hours at the time. And, and that's what I had said to him. I said, look, look how close all of this is. Look how close the Westman's window is to where the tree was to the road. I mean, just, I didn't think everything was that compact, but the vigil, the first vigil, it was, it's, it's a, it's a wonderful thing to attend and to, to feel the love of all the people there for Maura and for the, and for her family. And this past one, of course, like you said, uh, year 20, there was even more people. And this being my second time, I didn't really have that nervous feeling as I did the first. And uh, met some really, really 
wonderful people, got to see some wonderful people I met the year before again. Um, got to meet Sarah Turney, who was fantastic. She was there and she, you know, she, she's been helping Julia with the Media Pressure podcast. Uh, the ladies from the Light the Way organization, Tates and Shana, who are f absolutely fabulous. And, you know, the Murray family was there and just to feel, you, you could, it's electric. You can feel the love at the Mountain Lakes Lodge where they have the vigil. Uh, before we go over to the crash site that is you, you can feel the love in that room you can feel it and it's 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 a special thing to be a part of that so i i encourage like you said let's hope there's not another vigil but i would encourage anyone who really cares and and wants to try to help to uh to show up because the, the murray family does appreciate it and you can see it that's awesome and like you said that feeling being so tangible um i and i hear that from several other people who attend, like it is a very palpable, very tangible thing. And I think it's just something you have to be there to experience it because sometimes you could try to explain it as much as you can, but you don't know it unless you're there to experience it. And well, what was it like to interact with the Murrays? Well, I've gotten used to it over time. Uh, I don't, I don't, talk to them with a great frequency. Um, I message with, message with Julie probably the most here and there, but I, I don't want to bother her either. Um, yeah. But she's very, she's very easy to talk to. And, and, you know, I will message her reassuring her about my support and anything more that the group can do to help and all of that. And I, and I know she appreciates it and she knows she can reach out to me when, whenever she needs anything like that because that's why we're here and that's why we do it. And, uh, you know, Mr. Murray is just, he, he's the greatest guy, you know, just to, to see him and shake his hand. And when he talks about more, you can, you can see the love in his eyes and it's, it's, it, it's heartbreaking, but it's, but it's beautiful at the same time, if that makes any sense. Yes. And determined that is a determined yes. man. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I, I told him, I said, you're the, you're the CEO of the company. <laughs> you know, so right. we all work. For you. We all work for you. You got a little chuckle out of that. And then um, I even got close a little bit with Curtis, uh, who's a great guy, uh, to the point that we we don't just talk about Morris case. Uh, we were talking about the Patriots, uh, talking about our jobs, stuff stuff like that. And he's he's just a really really great guy, and uh, you get a really good feeling just even being around him. He's he's very positive, and he he's he's got a lot of light on him. That's for sure. And uh, this past vigil, I got to meet uh, Fred Jr. It was the first time, I guess, going up there in a while to the vigil. He kind of stays out of the public limelight, which is which is obviously his right to do. But uh, just to get to meet him and then say hello to him and introduce uh, myself to him, that, that was, you know, it was great. And like I said, the, you, you see people in the room that Oh, I know who that is, or I've spoken to that person, and you, you know, you get to give them a hug or shake their hand and, and say it's really, it's really great to meet you in person. I I met John Smith for the first time, and I've been talking to John for years. So to finally meet the man and shake his hand, see how gargantuanly tall he is. <laughs> he's a big man, <laughs> but he's like a big teddy bear. He's got a heart of gold, and you know, and and there was nobody disagreeing and nobody arguing. There were people in that room that had probably disagreed in the past, but it, it's not about that. We're all there for the same reason. We want to find Mora. We want to support her family. And any differences anyone had, you couldn't see it then. A lot of smiling faces, a lot of tears cried. Uh, it's it's a it's, it's a heck of a thing to be a part of. Like I said, and the love you could feel in that room, I'll I'll carry that with me the rest of my life. That's amazing. And, you know, to go back to the uh, accident scene, and I know you described how things seem more compact, almost like a stone throws away from everything, but like, what, what were you feeling? Like, what kind of feeling did you have? What were, did, were you, was it a nervous feeling being there? Like what? Cause I mean, I hear from other people, like they're unsettled when they're there, but I'm curious about your feelings uh, both times, um, not just at the, the visual where everyone's being there, but like also like when you and your friend, you're just driving by yourself and it's so dark. Yeah, well, when we when we went through there the first time, it, it was still light out, but it. Oh, OK. You, you did get 
you do get an eerie, it is an unsettling feeling. And it's hard to describe. I see. When you're there, when you're there, when everyone has their candles for the vigil, you're still feeling the love from coming from the lodge, even right. though it's pitch black. But you but you look around and you see how pitch black it is and and you think what was she what was she possibly thinking? How scary is this? You know, it, it's it's spooky when you're there with 40 people, but to to be there alone, I, I can't imagine how she must have been feeling. No cell service, uh, but it is. It, you do get a you do get an odd eerie feeling from it, and I don't know what that is. I don't know if because I feel there was foul play there. You can feel the energy of that. I I don't really know, but um, yeah, several other people I've spoken to over time have have said the same thing that. I've even had someone say you almost get a sick feeling there, which I didn't get that, but it it's kind of the hair on the back of your neck stands up sort of thing. Right. And I think a big part of it is knowing what happened there and knowing yeah. that there was a, you know, an accident and knowing that that was the last known place as far as any of us publicly know is where she was last seen. Anything else is no one's talking. So, I, you know, when you have that, you know, that knowledge, that insight, I can understand that. Um, when last year I visited the, um, the place where Skylar niece got murdered, uh, she was murdered by two of her so-called friends. And this is, and what the location is on a one-way road that is bordering. It's in Pennsylvania, but it's bordering West Virginia. And, I visited it, and the reason why is I, I'm not a big believer of visiting murder sites, but the reason why I visited it was because her her parents, they turned it into a memorial, mm -hmm. and because you know, the the body was uh, cremated, and they wanted this is where she last was, and plus, Skylar loved nature, so. I visited to pay my respects because I'm familiar with the case. Um, I'm empathetic with what happened. Um, David and Mary niece are, you know, your heart breaks for them, but they're also very courageous. So I just wanted to go to go visit. And it was scary because it is this one way road and it's so narrow. And there's also these curves and turns that if someone's coming from the other side, there's going to be no, no real warning to stop. You're going to collide into each other. So I'm going as slow as I can go um, until I finally get to the site. And, and I had two minds of it. One, there is that unsettling feeling to know that a horrific, uh, you know, a horrific event happened there. And it's really sad. But then there was this other really beautiful thing. Um, it is very serene. It is very peaceful. And Skylar loves butterflies. She loves them and she loves purple. And when I got there, man, and I took video of it, man, there was a whole clutter of these butterflies. And when you got close, man, they all just kind of circled around you. Mm -hmm. And it was this just almost magical type thing. And so, but if, there was nothing there to know that something occurred there. It would just be a one-way road that I'm passing through. So it, it had very two different energies. So I just wanted to kind of compare that. Yeah. Um, so last year, I, I really want to talk about this. Last year, you did something to honor Mora that I thought was pretty cool. And I think it's an amazing story. And I'd love for my audience to hear about it. So please, can you tell us what you did? You mean the Arizona thing, right? Yes. <clears throat> All right. So my longtime girlfriend and myself are obsessed with Arizona. <clears throat> We've gone the last three years and we're going again this summer. Uh, it's, it's our favorite place. It's our, you know, it's the place I feel most alive. I just, I just love it. I love the scene, you know, the, the rock and the, the, the desert landscape, the heat, because it is a dry heat, it is different. So anyone that thinks it's not, it is different because I'm from Massachusetts where it's 
so humid in the summer and I'm just dripping wet, sweating. It's not like that in Arizona. And we were there last year when it was 117 degrees. So it is different. But anyway, when we planned our trip last summer, uh, yeah, July of 2023, we, tr you know, we're trying to go to different places. We're trying to see everything the state has to offer. So part of our trip at the beginning was we were going to this really cool place called Bisbee, Arizona, which is in the southeastern part of the state. And so like anyone else, before you go anywhere, you, you look up, you know, what are the good restaurants in town? What are the attractions to see? And I kept coming up, I kept seeing this thing called the Bisbee Thousand Stair Climb. Now, to give you a little background, Bisbee is basically like the, the main towns, it's in, the, it's in like a small valley. And a lot of the homes, there's, there's hills and small mountains on the side of it. A lot of the homes are like implanted in the sides of the hills and mountains. So a lot of the residents there, they have there's staircases going up and down the hills everywhere. It's very interesting. Uh, Google some pictures of it. It'll give you a little perspective. But so this Bisbee Thousand Stair Climb Challenge is something they do. It's the third Saturday, third Saturday or Sunday in October, where uh, hundreds of people go to the town and they jog up these stairs. And those different staircases that are labeled. Uh, is 12 of them. Some are 120 steps, some are 50, some are 200. And if you do them all, it equals a thousand. So I said, I said, well, it's, you know what? Maura was a hell of an athlete. She could probably do that. I bet Julie could do it. Maybe I should do it. I'll try to do it and I'll try to do it to honor Maura. But I said, I'm not running up the stairs. I'll walk up the stairs. <laughs> Right. Uh, I wouldn't be talking to you if I ran up those stairs. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I went online and they, they have a map you can uh, print out and all of that. And I could see like where our Airbnb we were saying at is. So I said, OK, I'm going to have to do these a little bit out of order, but I can do them because, you know, you go up one of them and it almost connects to the to the next one or you just have to walk a block or two to connect to the next one. So uh, we got to Arizona. Went from Phoenix to Bisbee, uh, you know, went to bed that night. I decided I'm going to do it the first day we were there. Like I said, it was super hot, heat wave. So I got up before the sun came up, got dressed, had a cup of coffee, headed out. So it was like 5.30, 5.45 in the morning when I, when I started and I GoPro'd it and put it in the, um, Put it in the strength and numbers group so everyone could see it i had to chop it up into different videos because it was too long but i started with the first one i got to the top and i was like i don't know about this i don't because <laughs> one of the first one was like 100 st it was like 80 stairs or something like that i got to the top and i was like man i, I don't know about this and i did the second one and it was a little easier and i remember i was i was on one of them and it I, i'm going and i'm, I'm it's not even hot yet and I'm sweating and I said, oh man, this, I don't know if this is going to work. And, and it, it was almost like Maura was there saying, get up them stairs. You know, I could <laughs> feel like a push, like go, you can do it. And I said, all right, I'm, I don't care how, how, how bad it hurts. I'm going to finish this thing. So I did all of them and it was super cool. The views from the top of them were, were great. You could see the whole town. Um, some of them were, were windy and twisty and, and, uh, some of them, the, the steps were like really small and some of them, they were big. So it, it ran the gamut. It was all over the place. And you could tell those still staircases have been there for a hundred years. Wow. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, but I, I did them all. And then I, w I did the last video of it. Uh, it was in my rental car cause I had to sit down and, uh, just had an elated feeling. And, you know, I, I said, um, doing it for Maura, doing it for her family. But I, I, you know, I did it for me too, because it doing good feels good and it's, and it's the right thing. But it was a, it was a, it was quite a challenge. And I definitely got my steps in literally that day. Uh, but it was, uh, it was, it was just a cool thing I figured w w would be great. And um, Julie got a real kick out of it, thought it was a great thing. And, and uh, the people in the Facebook group loved it too. So it was, uh, it was pretty cool. I do it again. But um, yeah, <laughs> I, I brought three bottles of water and I ran out half, halfway through. So next time I'll have to bring six bottles of water. I don't know where I'm gonna put them, but 
because you don't want to carry a backpack or anything you don't need to carry doing those stairs, believe me. Right. Robert, that is a hell of a tribute, man. That is cool. I wanted everyone to hear about that because I thought that was great. Yeah, it went really well. And, and this year, uh, my girlfriend is going to be included in this year's. We're going to do something special. Uh, it's not quite something like that, but we're going to do something when we go to Arizona this summer for uh, a, something to, as a tribute to Mora. Um, but it's a surprise. So stay understandable. Tuned. Stay tuned, everyone, for that. And it's kind of cool. My girlfriend's involved this time, and uh, she has to be. And she's going to be in the video. I told her because she came up with the she came up with the idea for this one. So nice, that's great, man. Well, you know, I'll be paying attention. I can't wait to uh, I can't wait to see or hear about the reveal. So that's going to be cool. So you know, Robert, there are two upcoming things that are Mora Murray centered. Uh, would you share with us what's upcoming? Yeah. So. May 4th is Moore's birthday. And every year for the past four, uh, this will be the fourth year that, um, so the past three years, Julie's been doing, uh, it's called workout of the day. And what that is, is you can do a two mile walk or run and 82 burpees. Uh, the significance of that for Mora is back in her running days, uh, Mora's best time was the two mile run. And the 82 burpees is because she's, she was born in 1982. Um, they also have, if you go on the official website, um, you can get a t-shirt that says workout day uh, on it. I'm pretty sure they're still selling those. I checked a few weeks ago and they, they were. So you can get a t-shirt to wear while you do it too. And uh, everyone posts their pictures in the official Mormory Facebook page, uh, the, the group that Julie runs. Uh, you can post them in Strength in Numbers or any of the other groups. Uh, May May fourth is is different than uh, February 9th. February 9th is a kind of a sad day because it's the date Mora disappeared. But May fourth is her birthday, so we kind of try to celebrate her, and it's 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 more of a, a more of a happy thing. Um, definitely look forward to May fourth more than February 9th. Uh, the other thing added on to that is something that um. Strength in Numbers came up with a couple of years back that we did is the Random Acts of Kindness Challenge. And I'd asked Julie for this year, can we incorporate that again and do it? Uh, and that's basically what it sounds like. Uh, just make somebody smile that day and do it for Mora. Uh, let someone cut you in line at the grocery store. Uh, you go through the drive through to get your coffee in the morning. Buy the coffee for the guy behind you. Uh, just, just, just do something to make someone's day. Make them smile. Make them laugh not expecting anything back for it and do it in honor of Mora. Uh, Mora was going to be a nurse and uh, nurses, as we all know, help people. And so I just I figure that's a, that's a good added thing. Um, after you're out there sweating it up, doing the burpees and all that, you, you go and make somebody smile and it'll probably make you smile as well. You know, so uh, that's that's what's upcoming for May 4th. And uh, the workout day seems to get bigger every year. So Hopefully this year they, they knock it out of the park again, but it's uh, just great all around. And last year there was a scholarship that was given out to someone in, you know, Maura's name, Maura Murray's name. Is that happening again this year? Yeah. So this year will be the last year was the inaugural uh, Maura Murray scholarship. So at Whitman Hanson High School here in Massachusetts, uh, in Hanson, which is the high school Mora graduated from. Julie graduated from there as well. Uh, Julie put it together that they give a, it's a scholarship to a student who not only excels in academics, but also athletics. So somebody that was like Mora. So they did the first one last year, um, gave it to a, a great young lady who, who obviously deserved it. And um, so that'll be coming up right around, you know, graduation time, I would assume. I, I don't know the name of who's getting it yet. And um, Julie had told me that the, I believe it's the athletic director of the school had um, doubled the amount of the scholarship. So whatever the original amount is that, that uh, he or she had added to, to double it, which is, uh, which is great. 
That's incredible. Truly. I think it, I think it was the, it's either the athletic director or the principal of the school. I, I, I hate that. I don't remember that, but um, she had told me that recently. So that's, it's fantastic. But yeah, they'll, they'll, they'll be doing that. When, when's high school graduation? June-ish? I would think June. That's usually uh, when it is. Something like that. So I would, I would think we'd probably hear about that uh, not too long after Moore's birthday. So, Robert, is there anything else uh, that you would like to share or talk about regarding uh, Maura Murray or her case? Well, it's just that just for everyone that's interested in it to um, just keep the momentum going, keep Moore's name out there. Um, people in the community, we all have different strengths. I'm, I'm not really like the investigation type guy. Uh, I do a little bit of it, but it's, it's not my forte. So I try to keep Moore's name out there, keep the awareness, uh, keep my group engaged, which they do that on their own. Because I have some of the greatest members. Uh, and, and, and to just when, when discussing Moore's case or, or any other missing person or unsolved murder or anything, just, just remember to engage with empathy. Um, Julie came up with the Engage with Empathy campaign. It's It's been one of the greatest things uh, to ever come out of this community and it figures it comes from her family along with the media pressure podcast which was just fantastic um, if you're getting started just getting started and listening or wanting to hear about Moore's case start with the media pressure podcast start right there i'll tell you that right now uh it, it's just just to remember that Moore is not a character in a story she was a real person and her family are real people and that they're, you know, what they're going through. None of none of us know what they're going through, and twenty plus years of no answers. You know, their their sister, their daughter, gone, vanished, and having met the family and knowing them, I I know that all all they want to do is find Mora, and bring her home, and figure out what happened to her. And that's that's all they want, and uh, they all deserve that not going to call it closure, but they all deserve to have that. So just to just remember that there, there's real people behind this. And it, it, this isn't like, a, you know, it's not an entertainment thing. And as we said before, I, I didn't, I used to not think of myself as an advocate. I figured that was about three levels above where I was and in, in what I was doing. <clears throat> Excuse me, but I, I'm proud to say, you know, not as an egotistical thing, but I know I'm an advocate and I advocate for Maura Murray and I advocate for her family. And, you know, that's, that's something that I've been doing for a while now. And as I said before, you know, I'm in it till the end now as, as whatever it takes, as long as it takes, but just, uh, yeah, I mean, my, that's my only message. Just remember to engage with empathy and, and use your compassion. And if you can't, if you can't look into these sort of, cases in that in that mindset then maybe you should look into something else because uh we've had enough of that they've had enough of that obviously but um you know just remember this is this is this is real life but no that's about it i that you know as far as to add things just uh I'm so happy you invited me down here to to, to talk about this and uh any chance i get to talk to you is always great and I'm, I'm just glad to, I'm just doing my best out here to, to keep Moore's name out there and, and to be whatever support I can. And uh, the family really needs these answers. And Robert, I, I truly appreciate you doing the best you can and you are, you're doing an amazing job. And I'm glad that I asked that last question if you wanted to add anything because I couldn't have said it any better. So I'm glad that you did. So thank you so much. So ladies and gentlemen, this is Robert Lynch. If you engage with empathy, please go to his Facebook group and join it and participate in constructive and, you know, just good conversations and informative conversations because you never know it might lead to something. So but at the very least, let's keep her name out there because the last thing we want is for 
Maura Murray's name or anyone's name really to just be another name in a filing cabinet. So Robert, thank you so much. My pleasure. All right, ladies and gentlemen, this is Burn After Reading, and I'll catch you down the road.